Hello class. We are going to continue our discussions of pulmonary physiology and we're going to move on to ventilation. This includes discussions about um, what the basic volumes and capacities of the lungs are, what are their relative sizes, and how you measure them with a simple spirometer, and which ones you can't measure with a sp simple spirometer, um, and that sort of thing. We're going to talk about um, minute ventilation, alveolar ventilation, and dead space, and how dead space ventilation is um, calculated. Uh, we're going to talk about the function of dead space, um, and it can be measured with Fowler's method or the Bohr equation, and we want to talk about the difference between those two. And then another clinically important measure is the functional residual capacity. Um, and why you would measure FRC as opposed to the residual uh, function. Alrighty, so this is a, uh, a spirograph or um, uh, a reading of volumes and capacities with a simple spirometer. So we see tidal volume is a normal breath, in and out, in and out, in and out. If we breathe in, and exhale as much as we can. We've exhaled our expiratory capacity, so that's our tidal volume and our expiratory reserve volume. If we breathe back up um, to tidal volume, exhale a tidal volume, inhale, exhale, and we breathe all the way up, now we've, in, we've introduced our inspiratory capacity, which is made of the tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve volume. We exhale down, there's a place uh, where we, a very repeatab uh, repeatable place we come back to um, where the recoil forces of the chest wall and the expansion, I think I just said that backwards, where the expansion of the chest wall and the recoil forces of the lungs exactly balance. We take a breath, Take a breath, breathe all the way up, and then all the way down. And we get down to where we can't blow any more air. What we've just breathed in and out is our vital capacity. That's the total amount of air you can move in and out of the lungs. Uh, we breathe in, we exhale normally. What's left in the lungs is the functional residual capacity. So if we breathe, exhale a normal breath, what's left is functional residual capacity, but if we breathe out as much as we can, what's left is residual volume. The total amount of air in the lungs is called the total lung capacity. Now a simple spirometer can only measure what you can blow in and out. So you can measure tidal volume, you can measure expiratory reserve volume and expiratory capacity. You can measure inspiratory reserve volume and inspiratory capacity. You can measure vital capacity. But you cannot measure residual volume because you can't blow it out. And so anything that contains residual volume, namely functional residual capacity and total lung capacity, cannot be measured with a simple spirometer because um, uh, you can't move it through the spirometer. So functional residual capacity tends to be measured more than residual volume just because this is a natural resting place where the recoil of the lungs, the expansion of the chest balance. So this makes this a much more repeatable measure. You really have to coach somebody to get down to the residual volume. So we tend to measure residual, I'm sorry, functional residual capacity rather than residual volume. We use that with something called helium dilution and I believe I will talk about that in a subsequent presentation. So device used to measure volumes entering and exiting the lungs is a simple spirometer. You cannot measure volumes containing a residual volume, therefore residual volume, functional residual capacity, and total lung capacity require an indirect method like helium dilution or body plasmograph, and I will talk about that under lung function tests. 
All right, so one breath is a volume. But many breaths over time result in something called a ventilation. So volume times r respiratory rate, just like stroke volume times heart rate is your cardiac output, a volume of a breath times the resp resp respiratory rate gets you your ventilation in mils per minute or liters per minute. So the total or minute ventilation is tidal volume times respiratory rate. So if your tidal volume is 500, your respiratory rate is 12 breaths a minute, that's 6,000 mils per minute. Now we might want to know what's just going into the alveoli. What's the part exchanging gas? We'd have to s subtract off something called the dead space, the air that's not exchanging gas, the air in your mouth and your nose and your pharynx and your airways. Let's say for right now we estimate that to be about 150. So 500 minus 150 mils of alveolar volume times 12 breaths a minute gets us 4,200 mils per minute. So about 4 liters a minute is your typical alveolar ventilation. And that's important to know because that's the air that's actually exchanging gas. So let's think about increasing the respiratory rate but keeping the ventilation the same or the minute ventilation the same. If you increase respiratory rate and increase the minute ventilation, how will that affect your alveolar ventilation and your dead space ventilation? So the mils per minute going into your alveoli, the mils per minute staying in your dead space. So I'm not going to tell the answer right this second. I'd like you to think about it. But if you keep minute ventilation the same, and the respiratory rate goes up, then, let's see if I can find a pen here. So if respiratory rate goes up, and minute ventilation, I don't say I show this in the PowerPoint, but you really should put a dot over things to indicate their ventilation. Well, that would suggest that the tidal volume would have to go down. But the question is, would these two change in the same way? And we'll get back to this in class. Now, anatomic dead space is the volume of the mouth and the nose and the non-respiratory airways. It's an anatomical thing. It's, it it's, depends on how big you are. If you're a taller person, you'll have more dead space. If you're a shorter person, you'll have less dead space. It's very important for warming and moistening the air. We approximate it by a person's weight in pounds. So if somebody weighs 150 pounds, and that's lean body mass, we would say oh, their dead space is probably about 150 mils. But we can also measure it using something called Fowler's method. So this shows a, a, a record from somebody measuring uh, Fowler's uh, dead space with Fowler's method. So you breathe in air that's 100% oxygen. And then you exhale into a nitrogen analyzer. So ambient air is about 80% nitrogen. You see that? So this person breathes in 100% oxygen and then they exhale. And notice that the nitrogen drops down to zero. Why is that? Because they breathed in 100% oxygen. And so what they breathed in is in the dead space and filled with 100% oxygen. And so they breathe out and then nitrogen starts to go up and it goes up and it goes up and it goes up and it's up and up and up and up and then it levels off and then at the end it goes up again. So we're interested in this part right here. I'm going to try to drop down a line and we use a little geometry and we assume that this area right here is equal to this area right here 
And so we can take this little triangle right here and measure the volume of that and get the dead space volume. What's the basis of that? Well, if you inhale 100% oxygen, your dead space is filled with 100% oxygen. As you start to exhale some nitrogen, that, that shows us we're starting to see air from the alveoli. And then when it levels off, then we're getting all air from the alveoli. There's no dead space air in here. So we, we could um, do an integral of this curve, but instead of doing calculus, we're going to do geometry. And you, this area goes over here, and you, now you have a little nice little rectangle, which is easy to take the area of. Now what's this over here? You have airways terminal airways that don't have cartilage and at, at the end of the breath those airways start to collapse and as they do the nitrogen goes up a little bit so you can also use this method to say when do people's airways start to close and then they get to a point where you know they can't get out any more air but Fowler's method tells us about the anatomy of someone's lungs so physiologic dead space, which is the air that doesn't ch exchange gas, is normally equal to anatomic dead space, which is the mouth, the nose, the airways. However, with disease, some alveoli can convert to dead space. So in that case, physiologic dead space would be greater than anatomical dead space. So we can measure physiologic dead space, how much air is, or how much of the alveoli is um, not exchanging gas using something called the Bohr equation. So anatomic dead space plus alveolar dead space, which we'd get from the Bohr equation, would tell us our physiologic dead space. So the Bohr equation is used to quantify the ratio of physiologic dead space to the tidal, total tidal volume and gives an indication of wasted ventilation. And in this particular permutation, we're actually seeing the alveolar dead space. And this is arterial CO2. This is end tidal CO2 and arterial CO2. So you take this ratio, and it gives you the ratio of alveolar dead space to tidal volume. Uh, so if arterial PCO2 is 42 millimeters of mercury, and your end tidal PCO2 is, oh darn it, I have a typo, I am so sorry, is zero. Please make a note, and I'll have to fix the presentation. And if your end tidal PCO2 is 40, and your tidal volume is 500, we, put, we, we um, plug those in, so X over 500, equals 42 minus 40 divided by 42. X is about 24 mils. So if we have alveoli that are not exchanging gas, then less CO2 can escape via exhalation. So if your anatomic dead space is 150 and about 24 mils of the alveoli, um, are not exchanging, then our physiologic dead space is 174 mils. I'm not co so concerned about you calculating this. Here's what I want you to think about. If the measurement of dead space with the Bohr equation is greater than that measured by Fowler's method, what does that tell you? That tells you you have disease. It tells you that some of your alveoli are not exchanging gas and have become part of the dead space and that's the value of that comparison. So I'm going to stop it here. Uh, in our next presentation we're going to talk about how ventilation influences blood gases, the partial pressure of oxygen and CO2. Um, so I'll see you next time.